Welcome to 202 as a uh, summary where we left off was on this uh, slide and we were talking about or the things that you have to know I guess let's go with that the things that you have to know are that the afferent arterial is the arterial going into the glomerulus or Bowman's capsule where a net filtration pressure of 10 is going to move fluid from the blood into the filtrate or into the glomerular space at a net pressure of 10. It's going to move the fluid along with things like sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, whatever needs to go in there. It is going to keep out, in or meaning in the blood, uh, large proteins like albumin, for example. The reason proteins can't get through into the urine, at least large proteins, is because of that little filtration system that had <clears throat> the porous uh, membranes, the uh, tiniest of them all were the filtration slits in that area. The second largest was the basal uh, membrane or the lamina densa and the largest were simply the fenestrations in the capillaries themselves. Okay. Also on the way out is the efferent arterial, and you should know that where it takes things back into the blood and also through a whole series of small um, peritubular capillaries going throughout the entire nephron so that things could be reabsorbed back in, such as sodium, potassium, chloride, phosphorus, whatever, calcium. Also important to know is the proximal convoluted tubule is where most of that reabsorption is happening of the things that need to be back in, but you also should know the descending and ascending loop of Henle. The whole point of the loop of Henle is to create a concentration gradient so that you can power the, the movement of ions in and out as needed, and that's done by sucking a whole lot of water out um, and getting the, the filter it very very concentrated down here at the bottom of the loop of Henley. All right so as you can see sodium and chloride are going back into the blood starting in the ascending loop of Henley and continues throughout the whole process and the distal convoluted tubule is where we have a lot more action going on um, that's where we saw for example this A in both places the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct you can see where sodium is going back out of the filtrate into the blood therefore it is being reabsorbed and as that's happening potassium is being dumped or dropped into the collecting duct and therefore into the urine what hormone do we know that does that reabsorbs sodium and exchanges it for one potassium that's right that's aldosterone and also notice that when that sodium goes back water follows it too so that is one of the things that's going to be uh, responsible for raising blood pressure as needed. Also, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, does the same thing, except that it doesn't worry about sodium. It just directly reabsorbs water back into the bloodstream to raise your blood pressure. Now, also what was very uh, significant to remember was when you were in the um, glomerulus, or in that area about the, the, the start of the nephron. You also had the JG apparatus, the juxtular glomerular apparatus, that was responsible for secreting renin if the blood pressure got too low, and renin would set off that whole angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2 system that would in, in turn raise the blood pressure back up. So I think those are some of the important things that we need to know and remember about uh, this kidney nephron. And then uh, we'll move on. Okay, so the goal of all of it, of course, is, is not really to, to produce urine. I mean, we could really care less, biologically speaking, about that. We're really maintaining homeostasis by keeping things that should be in the blood in the blood and things that need to be excreted, the the waste, you know, the uric acid, the ammonia, the, the things that we have too much of um, to get rid of those in, in, in the waste as in as through urine. Okay? Anyway. I guess that's about it on there. You can read the rest of that. Let me move on. Okay? 
these are some of the organic waste products that I was talking about for example uh, urea obviously urine has urea the breakdown of amino acids is what makes urea and amino acids if you remember are all of those little uh, well amino acids they're the building blocks of protein of course so when you find some people will will refer to finding protein in your urine normally that's what you're talking about is you're talking about you know broken down proteins in the form of amino acids okay and you you have so many of of those things that that you can find in your urine but uh, exceeding the limits sometimes people will say well there's a lot of protein in your urine there shouldn't be the big proteins in your urine like the um, albumin because that would signif signify significant kidney damage anyway along that same line is creatinine notice that is not creatine as in creatine phosphate creatine phosphate is that stuff that people take as a supplement um, it is quick energy like 20 30 seconds worth of energy it's very quick um, and people will take that as supplements if you take too much of it of course then you're gonna have really high levels of creatine in or creatinine in your urine which makes expensive urine I guess I'll leave it at that uric acid of course is a waste product um, during uh, recycling of RNA but if you look at all of these three things what they have in common is they're basically protein breakdown okay <clears throat> this is informational I can't imagine how I could possibly test you on this um, well, I guess urine, usually you do produce about 1.2 liters a day of concentrated urine. I don't know how that helps you, but that is a fact. And, of course, all facts like that certainly can be tested. But uh, other than that, um, this urine color chart is just a, a, a quick um, indication of whether or not somebody is dehydrated or not. Uh, notice that there is a, a note down here about vitamins, and vitamins can certainly change the color of the urine. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. Now, uh, these should be review about reabsorption and secretion mechanisms. Of course, diffusion is the movement of stuff from a high concentration to a low concentration, so it, of course, uh, equalizes and maintains homeostasis. Osmosis, same thing, but now water is moving instead of stuff. Uh, you have channel-mediated diffusion, which um, really carrier-mediated transport, you have to rely on a channel. But uh, what channel-mediated diffusion is talking about is if you have some kind of a protein, a transmembrane protein, and something goes from here to here, but it doesn't need any help, then, of course, that's just it's going right through a channel. Okay? Carrier mediated transport, we'll talk about in a second here, um, but that actually has to have a, a, a carrier protein, like it says here. Okay? Uh, there are four types of carrier mediated transport. So, facilitated diffusion, that's a concentration gradient. Again, if something is diffusing, like we talked about already, it's following your concentration gradient, going from high to low. You don't need energy for that, you don't need any ATP. On the other hand, active transport, it's going against the current, as it were. It's going against the concentration gradient, and therefore you have to have energy, or ATP, to do that. Co-transport, we saw that a while back. A, an example in the kidney uh, was uh, sodium and uh, glucose going the same way. So if they're going through in the same direction... Um, either in or out. That's a co-transport system. And a counter-transport system is the opposite, where one thing goes in, one thing goes out. We just saw that with sodium and potassium, where sodium travels one way and potassium pet travels the other way. Okay, So I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Now, the concept of saturation is that normally, um, if you do get... I, I even hesitate to use the word protein in here because you really shouldn't have proteins in your urine anyway, but um, <coughs> if you...